All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now, there were devout Jews from every people under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. You don't know this about me, but I have an undergraduate degree in linguistics, the study of language. And that has always meant that I look at the famous story of the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts a little differently from other readers. I cannot just turn off the linguist part of my brain when I read it. I cannot help but notice, for example, that on one level, the miracle of people speaking in different languages was not really necessary, at least not for comprehension. It is true, of course, that various people who lived in various places spread all over the known world at that time had their own local languages. But it is also true that because of the conquests of Alexander the Great and the spread of the Roman Empire, many people had also learned at least one other language. If you traveled or traded or dealt with government officials, you learned to speak Greek. You had to, just to get by. And so, even if expatriate Jews and some Gentiles had traveled to Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost, and even if they spoke the local language back home, they all had a very easy and convenient way to communicate with each other. Just speak Greek. So, what is the point of these members of the church suddenly speaking with all these local languages from back home? What is it supposed to accomplish? It can't be about comprehension. So what is it about? Ah, but any linguist understands that language isn't just about comprehension. It also serves several social functions. So, I suspect that something else is going on here. But, to understand what it is, you may need to hear the story of one of those outsiders who had come in for the festival that year. This is Retelling the Bible. Episode 7.12 Now you're speaking my language. Shimeon was a Jew. But he was a Jew who had lived all his life in Parthia. And for almost all of that life, 
the king of Parthia had been at war with the emperor of Rome. Even though it was practically required of all Jews that they should travel to Jerusalem every year for the three main festivals, everyone understood that those who lived elsewhere, farther afield, could only make the trip rarely. But when you live in a place at war with Rome, when you literally have to cross a demilitarized zone to get from your home to the temple in Jerusalem, well, you can imagine that even doing so rarely could become impossible. The fact of the matter was that Shimeon had never been able to make the pilgrimage, not even once in his entire life. So he had been so very excited when things had worked out and he was able to come down for the festival of Pentecost this year. It was a wonderful opportunity to connect with the heritage and tradition of his people that had always been so hard to hold on to in far-off Parthia. As a Jew, a member of a minority community, he had always felt like an outsider in Parthia. He was excluded from all religious festivals and most other social gatherings in the mainstream society. So, of course he'd been looking forward to being in a place where he was surrounded by Jewish people and by Jewish practices and worship. He had thought that he might find himself here. But things had not quite gone as he had expected. A lot of it had to do with language. When the small Jewish community in Parthia gathered in synagogue, they sometimes did some prayers and rituals in the old Hebrew language. But the old language didn't mean much to them. When the elders read the scriptures, they occasionally read from the few Hebrew scrolls that they had but then they had to explain what they meant, especially to the younger people, in Greek. So it was usually much easier to read from the popular Greek translation known as the Septuagint. These scrolls had first been published some two centuries earlier and were also easier to obtain in far-off Parthia than any Hebrew scrolls. So, while Shimeon had heard some archaic Hebrew, he really wasn't comfortable using it. But he hadn't expected that to be a problem on this pilgrimage. Wherever he had traveled before, he had always managed to get by in Greek. Surely things would be the same in Jerusalem. But it had not worked out that way. As he dealt with the native Judeans, bartering for a place to stay or food in the marketplace, or even just asking for some directions, when he spoke to them in Greek, he could tell that they could understand him. When he asked for the price of figs, for example, they looked right at the basket of figs in the booth. But then they stubbornly answered him, in the local dialect of Aramaic. Aramaic was somewhat related to Old Hebrew, so he was sometimes able to work out what they were saying. But then, when he tried to answer them in the language that he had heard in the synagogue back home, they laughed at him. <laughs> 
calling his accent strange and ill-tutored. Then they use this as a ready excuse to overcharge him or deny him the goods that he had been looking for. You see, the Judeans, who had so long felt like outsiders in the big world of the Roman Empire, tended to make up for that by treating those who came from other places like minorities and outsiders. They refused to speak common Greek to them. They doubled down on the local Aramaic dialect and were only too happy to make fun of the way that the outsiders spoke. They did this to all of the outsiders who came down to the festivals, even those who came from as close as Galilee. Galileans, in many ways, were the most like the Judeans, especially in their dialect. But the Judeans went out of their way to make fun of their strange northern accent. So, even though participating in the events of the festival had meant a great deal to him, ever since he had arrived, Shimeon still felt as if he didn't belong here either. It made him wonder if he really belonged anywhere. The greatest day, the climax of the festival, was the day when the people brought their first fruits to present in the temple. It was a chance to give back to God from the very best that God had given to them over the year. And Shimeon was excited as he joined the throng moving through the streets. If he didn't speak, no one looked at him twice. And for a few moments, he could feel as if he was part of something bigger than himself. But suddenly, as he passed by a side street, he heard some shouting. It sounded different. It didn't have the same cadence and rhythm as the local Aramaic dialect. It seemed strange and out of place here. And yet the thing that really struck Shimeon about it was a strange familiarity. There was something in it that felt like home to him, as if he were suddenly back on the streets of the city in Parthia, where he had grown up and played with the other local boys. And so he turned aside, as did a number of other worshippers in the crowd. They soon came upon a small group of men and women who had gathered outside of a house. It was quite plain that all of them, by their clothing and their mannerisms, were Galileans. But, amazingly, they weren't speaking like Galileans. To his wonder and amazement, Shimeon noticed that one of them a young man, was shouting out praises to God in the local language of Parthia, the very language he had grown up speaking on the streets. As he looked around him, he saw many other pilgrims had been drawn to the spot as well. They, like him, had traveled from many places to be here for the festival. Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia. Oh, there were too many to name. And he could see by the looks on their faces and by the tears that they were wiping from their eyes that they were reacting much as he had. They also had felt completely excluded up until this moment. <laughs> 
but they all suddenly felt that they belonged. But these expatriates were not the only ones who had been attracted by the disturbance. There were also some local people too, some Judeans, and they were moved by what they heard as well, but not in the same way. Many of them were furious, for in and amongst all of the various languages and accents that had been emanating from the group of Galileans, there were also words spoken in the local Judean dialect. The Judeans in the crowd felt as if they were being mocked by these crude Galileans. Why, the very idea that their language, the language obviously favored by God, could be counted merely as one among so many others, was unacceptable. And so they, for their part, began to shout out against these Galileans. Don't listen to these country bumpkins, they cried. Here it is, only nine o'clock in the morning, and they are already drunk and raving like lunatics. But then the crowd fell silent as one of the Galileans stepped forward. Everyone wanted to hear what he might have to say about such wonders. Fellow Judeans and all who live in Jerusalem, he said, speaking specifically to those who had been criticizing them. He spoke in very poor Greek, mixed with many Aramaicisms and a heavy Galilean accent. Let this be known to you and listen to what I say, he went on. Indeed, these people are not drunk, as you suppose, for as you said, it is only nine o'clock in the morning. And so began the very first Christian sermon ever preached. When the writer of the book of Acts started writing his account of the beginnings of the Christian movement, he knew a number of things about the earliest church. He knew, for example, that one of the practices of the church from near to the beginning, and perhaps it continued in his own day, included believers speaking in strange languages. It worked like this. Some believers, while they were gathered with the community in worship, would enter into an ecstatic state. This is something that human beings have been doing for a very long time. They get all worked up in a frenzy until they lose ordinary control of themselves. It is something that still happens to this day in various settings, including worship services and raves, and even, of course, some practices that use psychotropic drugs. In this state, the believers would sometimes speak in unintelligible languages. As far as we can tell, these were not actual languages, but more like ecstatic utterances. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul insisted that they could only be understood through a similar act of ecstatic interpretation by another believer, which is an indication that they were not ordinary languages. Linguists have carried out studies on the practice as it occurs in modern times and have discovered many interesting things. <laughs> 
the utterances, have a certain structure and composition that is very language-like. But, as far as researchers have been able to establish, they are not well-structured enough to be an effective language. No one has ever been able to find an instant where such a worshipper actually spoke in any identifiable language. But the act of speaking in tongues could be, and can be, very moving. It is a very meaningful devotional practice for many people, and I hardly want to be critical of it or them. It is a practice that has the effect of deepening the worshipper's connection to God and the community through the Holy Spirit. So impressive was the practice, in fact, that those who engaged in it in the early church seem to have sometimes thought that they were somehow better Christians than those who didn't. The Apostle Paul sharply criticized the believers in Corinth for having that kind of attitude. In any case, the author of the book of Acts obviously knew about this practice. But when he came to write the story of the origins of the Christian church, he decided to present it in a different way. He decided, for just this one occasion it seems, to transform this speaking in strange tongues into something that wasn't just ecstatic and unintelligible. He had the first Christians, on that first day, speak in the local languages of people from every corner of the known world. Why did he do this? I think he was trying to say something, something that was probably more symbolic than it was literal. We don't actually know who wrote the Book of Acts. Christian tradition says that it was a man named Luke, but we can hardly be sure of that. Whoever he was, though, we can say a couple of key things about him. First, he was likely a man. Most well-educated writers were. But we also know that he was someone who spoke Greek as his first language. His Greek is excellent. So, perhaps, he had had the experience, as a Greek, interested in the God of Israel, of going to a festival in Jerusalem and being treated like an outsider. He knew what it was like to be someone who the locals thought talked funny. I wonder if that is why he reimagined the practice of the early church of speaking in tongues as something that could overcome that kind of prejudice and mistreatment. If that is what he was doing, he was putting forward something very hopeful. He was drawing a compelling picture of what the church could be. A community where there really was a place for anybody, and nobody ever got treated as a second-class citizen. That is an idea of the church that I still cling to and aspire to. I'll leave it for you to judge for yourself how well the Christian church has lived up to that aspiration. That is it for this episode of Retelling the Bible. Please subscribe so you can get the next episode in a couple of weeks. And do leave a review on your podcast provider to help other people find and appreciate this podcast. The theme music for the podcast is Ada by Kevin McLeod, and the mood music for this episode was Grundar by Alexander Nakarada. The music is licensed under the Creative Commons and can be found at filmmusic.io. You can contact me on Twitter at Retelling Bible, on the Facebook page Retelling the Bible, 
Show notes for this episode have been posted at retellingthebible.wordpress.com. Thanks to my awesome Patreon supporters who back this podcast. If you'd like to join them or discover the benefits they receive, go to patreon.com slash retelling the Bible. This is Retelling the Bible, and I have been your storyteller, W. Scott McCandless. <laughs>